name is Zoe Siegel. And for those who don't know me, I am the Director of Climate Resilience here at Greenbelt Alliance. Thank you so much for joining our Resilience Playbook webinar this afternoon about building homes away from fire. This, this webinar is part of a series that highlights the key climate challenges and opportunities that the Bay Area faces as a way to bring together experts and thought leaders to present the most prevalent issues in our region. Today, we are very excited to be joined by Michael Dermarad and Kate Lyons from the Association of Bay Area Governments and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. They will introduce themselves and share more about their work momentarily. But first, for those new to Greenbelt Alliance, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about us if this is your first time joining us. Greenbelt Alliance is an environmental nonprofit based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. We leverage our expertise in land use policy advocacy and regional collaboration to realize a climate resilient Bay Area. We do this by publishing original research and creating tools that guide local planners and advocates on climate adaptation issues. We're fortunate to live in a region with a strong level of environmental awareness and proud to have so many residents and activists passionately dedicating their time to work with us in order to achieve our shared vision of resilience. At the same time, local environmental and climate activists, community leaders, and elected officials can often feel overwhelmed and frustrated by decisions being made and inaction in Washington and beyond. Fortunately, there is significant meaningful action we can take at the local level. We can actively participate to be, a, to be more resilient to a changing climate, reduce our climate impact, and be more inclusive. This seems like a triple win, right? All we have to do is build more homes here in our own neighborhoods, towns, and cities away from wildfire zones. And we'll get, that's what we're getting into later. But how do we really do this and keep our community safe from the impacts of climate change at the same time? In order, to, in order to drive powerful local advocacy, we've developed the Resilience Playbook. And for those who have not yet uh, checked out the playbook, you can go to resilienceplaybook.org and and take a look. We're not gonna get into the, the details of it here, but I wanted to pull out a few key pieces from it. The playbook brings together a collection of curated strategies, resources, and toolkits from around the region to support local dec decision makers and community leaders as they look to accelerate the region's adaptation to climate risk. These policies connect nature and resilience. They leverage natural and working lands as defense mechanisms to absorb floodwaters. They sequester, there's policies around carbon sequestration, and protecting the water supply and providing buffers to wildfires. And in tandem, we address critical issues of housing justice, a just transition away from fossil fuels towards green jobs, and environmental justice is embedded throughout. We do this in order to ensure the outcomes of these policies, that the, that the outcomes of these policies really prioritize the resilience of the most vulnerable communities. And we hope that the practitioners and activists and local community leaders and city staff can really utilize the resilience playbook when engaging in local planning efforts like the housing element update that is happening in every city in California right now. Um, and we are today we're going to talk a bit about the strategies cities can use to make both new construction and existing communities safer from wildfire. Greenbelt Alliance has a long history of partnering with MTC ABAG on many issues and we're grateful for their participation and feedback on the resilience playbook throughout the, the process of developing it. Many of the policies in the playbook are a direct result of their suggestions and existing guidance that they have produced. Before I pass the mic over to them, I do wanna highlight a few key policies um, related to this from the playbook that you can then go into the playbook uh, and take, it, take a peek at. So the first policy that we, uh, that we feature related to both wildfire and housing really is prioritizing infill housing. And that's a thread throughout the playbook. And on the right-hand side of the screen is a direct policy that's pulled from the playbook in the policy matrix. And it's critically important to adopt policies like this that emphasize development in safe infill locations in recognizing that some development will still occur in the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, which we will discuss more shortly. These policies really need to distinguish between areas that are already developed where urbanization could be further encouraged and undeveloped areas where conservation efforts like permanently protecting green belts should be pursued. Speaking of green belts, um, here at Green Belt Alliance, it may not come as a surprise to you that we know green belts are a strategic defense against wildfires. 
policies, there need to be policies in place that require or strongly encourage conservation of undeveloped land in high fire risk areas in order to create defensible space and natural wildfire buffers and to preserve, preserve the rich biodiversity in wildfire prone areas. On the screen here is an image of the four types of green belts that is one of the main takeaways from our white paper, the critical role of green belts in wildfire resilience, where we document ample evidence that green belts can and do play a role in reducing the loss of life and home in extreme wildfire events where increasing wildfire resilience in communities and across landscapes is critically important. But it's not as simple as just building more infill housing and protecting open spaces. We'll get into this more later, but it's also important to update and strengthen the WUI, Wild Land Urban Interface land use policies and build more and, and, and update the building codes to encourage the use of, multi of a multi-hazard approach in considering where new development should be either encouraged or discouraged. Um, we at Greenbridge Alliance really support the development of uniform standards for resilient growth management strategies in towns and cities where homes are currently located in the wildland urban interface. And these policies really need to in include programs that harden existing structures and develop standards for the creation and preservation of defensible space, while also creating fire safe road conditions, evacuation plans, and harden uh, community refuge as a, of a last resort, like schools or, or hospitals or, or things like that. As every city in the Bay Area is updating the housing process, making sure these policies are being considered in your community is extremely important. And we know this is a really critical moment to build more climate smart housing to address both our housing and climate crisis. But how do we do that without putting more communities at risk of wildfire? And what can we do to protect the existing communities? Over the past few months, AVAG and MTC have developed a series of resources and webinars directed at supporting cities and answering this question. Michael and Kate are going to walk us through some of the challenges that cities are facing in terms of building in the wildland urban interface and how the, regula how the regulatory landscape has changed, what the role of the state is in all of this and what policy changes are recommended and more. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Michael and Kate. Thanks, Zoe. So I'll take over the screen share now and jump in. So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Greenbelt Alliance, for hosting us today. I'm Michael Gumrod. I'm a resilience planner with ABAG and MTC. Uh, ABAG and MTC support the nine county Bay Area and the 101 cities within them. And over, as, as Zoe just mentioned, over the past few months, we've been organizing workshops with local jurisdictions to consider how they can integrate wildfire into their housing element update. And I'll let Kate go ahead and introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. My name is Kate Lyons, and I I'm a Civic Spark Fellow supporting the Resilience Planning Group under Michael at ABAG MTC for this service year. And when I started in September, I jumped right into these wildfire and housing workshops. So I'm really excited to share everything that we learned with you today. And we just need to add one more kudos to Kathy Capriola, who is a project consultant on this uh, working group. Kathy is the former town manager for the town of Sonoma, and in 2017, she was the town manager during that set of wildfires. So before we jump in, we thought it would be helpful to just go through some, some basic definitions that we'll be talking about, uh, the wildland urban interface, really where uh, kind of open space, vegetated areas meet the urban or suburban zone. Uh, and where we start to see some of the impacts of wildfire affecting development, and in particular in the Bay Area, uh, residential uh, properties. Defensible space and home hardening are two often talked about strategies to address wildfire directly on the property. So defensible space is all about ensuring there's kind of clearance of vegetation around the home so that the fire can't encroach on a home. And home hardening is ensuring that uh, bu uh, the building envelope is designed in a way to resist uh, wildfire ignition. Uh, the general plan housing element, Zoe also mentioned, uh, all the Bay Area jurisdictions are simultaneously updating uh, that uh, policy document. It's a once every eight year process. Uh, and in it, there's a lot of opportunities to embed how communities should be thinking about preserving the existing units that are out there today, but also thinking about 
uh, where new units should go and how those should be developed. In terms of what we've really focused on uh, over the past few months and what we're gonna be describing today is really at the intersection of housing and wildfire issues. We're not trying to focus and solve kind of the housing challenge that we have as a region and state. We're not trying to solve the whole wildfire issue. We're really focusing on where those two sectors uh, intersect. As Zoe mentioned, the best approach to addressing the housing and wildfire issue is to put the majority of housing, at least uh, future housing, in areas that don't have wildfire. That's a great strategy. It's the most straightforward way to, to address uh, the issue. Uh, but we know that there's over 80,000 uh, residential parcels in the Bay Area, over 100,000 units of housing that are already in that zone. Uh, and there are some jurisdictions that really can't just escape and, and locate housing outside of areas uh, uh, with wildfire risk. A number of Bay Area communities uh, have some degree of wildfire risk that extends across the majority or uh, whole community. Uh, and our work, we really focused on that intersection. And we've really tried to hold all of these pieces at the same time and aren't trying to solve a singular challenge by itself. If we were only solving for wildfire or only solving for housing affordability and housing protection needs, our solutions would look very different. And so we've tried to hold all these pieces together, acknowledge the changing landscape that's occurring in the state, both in terms of regulatory, as well as just the realities of the changing climate, and also how different folks within local government are needing to work in new ways together uh, to address this challenge. Great, so throughout the workshops, we were really grateful to have experts from the national, state, and local levels come to talk to our audi audience about topics ranging from evacuation to land use to defensible space. And our experts, they were a vital part of helping us not only understand the issues ourselves, but also convey it in a way that was really helpful to jurisdictions to not only understand the issue, but be able to develop some policies, programs, and solutions to these issues. So these speakers ranged from emergency response professionals to local government staff. And then we also had some state and national researchers who are leading on the topic. So throughout our four workshops, we, we, held, them, we held them monthly for four months throughout the fall. And we started by giving folks an overview of the issue in September at our Wildfires and Housing 101 session. Then in October, we launched into covering defensible space and home hardening. So what's happening on the property. And then in November, we started talking about evacuations and how that all plays into the housing uh, crisis. And then in December, we kind of wrapped that all into land use planning and land use policy in the WUI and also covered some information about ADUs. We also will cover kind of the key takeaways as we address the challenges that emerged from these workshops throughout this presentation. And that brings me to the next slide, which overviews the four challenges uh, that we kind of kept emerging throughout um, all of these workshops. So these are the challenges that we kind of attempted to address with our policy and pro programming suggestions that we highlighted in our resource guides that we produced throughout the series. So I'll introduce the challenges now and then we'll dive into each challenge individually throughout the rest of the presentation. Challenge one gets at the core issue of wildfire and housing, which is just reducing the chance that homes ignite in the first place. Our experts shared with us that preventing the first structure from igniting is the, what usually the difference between the majority of homes in that neighborhood surviving or burning. So for this challenge, we'll discuss the legislation shaping the space and what homeowners and jurisdictions can do to address the challenge. In challenge two, we address the wildfire adaptation for dense housing or suburban wooey environments. Defensible space rec recommendations sometimes don't allow for suburban environments where houses are spaced close together. So we're looking for some solutions there where our houses are already spaced densely in the wooey. And then for challenge three, we wanted to focus on the challenge of new housing development in the hills or the wooies 
that can increase concerns about bottlenecks and loads. And this came, comes up a lot when we're talking about the regional housing needs allocation and having jurisdictions have to designate housing in the hills and worrying about that being able to affect the existing residents and new residents' abilities to evacuate safely. And then finally, at challenge four, we aim to capture the need for collaboration between individuals and communities, communities and other communities, and staff within communities to achieve wildfire adaptation together. Um, you know, wildfire adaptation cannot just happen if one person adapts their home. It really matters what their neighbor does as well. So um, that's challenge four. And then before we launch into each challenge in depth, I want to raise some of the equity tensions that come up repeatedly as we work to address these challenges. So we'll introduce them now and then highlight them as they arise throughout the, the presentation. So first, adapting homes and properties to wildfire, it can be expensive. Installing new decks or redoing a roof can cost thousands of dollars and not everyone living in the WUI has the dispensable income to do these things. As we place focus on adapting homes, we also should advocate for incentive programs at every level of government to support homeowners who may not be able to afford these upgrades. Second, the principle of defensible space is meant to prevent structure ignition from the ground and other nearby structures, but enforcing wider setbacks can limit an area's ability to accommodate more housing and address the region's urgent housing supply needs. And then finally, in the, in the hills of the Bay Area, uh, many of these areas are more prone to wildfires, but they're also typically high income areas with high economic opportunity. So we wanna be aware that limiting housing in these areas can also limit access to the opportunity that lies in these areas. And with that, we'll launch into the first challenge, which is structure ignition, and I'll pass it back to Michael. Thanks, Kate. So, uh, you know, our focus has really been on the impact of wildfires on the residential sector. And uh, the first challenge is just how do we prevent homes from igniting in a wildfire event? And uh, a lot of experts describe kind of three different ways that homes ignite. We've grayed out one and we're gonna come back to that in challenge two. Uh, the first way and most common ways that we see homes ignite and destroyed in wildfires is with ember casting where a wildland fire is burning vegetation, uh, producing embers that then uh, uh, the wind blows forward and then gets stuck on a uh, roof, eaves, vents, uh, little slight openings on a window that then creates uh, a place for a fire to, to start on the home itself. Uh, the second way that we see homes ignite is by flame contact where the fire is progressing. And as it meets uh, residents, it has a clear path to basically get to the home by just kind of burning the next thing in front of it. Uh, until it gets to the home and then the home catches fire. In general, the two kind of often talked about uh, approaches that homeowners can take, the communities can take, is around home hardening, where you're really focused on reducing the likelihood that if an ember uh, 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 hits a home, uh, that it's uh, hitting a non-combustible uh, material or that it's uh, not able to actually enter kind of within the home because your vents have proper screening and the eaves are designed in a way where it can't really enter the home and then start a fire. The defensible space side is all about uh, uh, clearing vegetation in a way. It doesn't necessarily mean it just being kind of concrete all around your home. There's lots of ways to do uh, defensible space in a way where you're still uh, able to have vegetation, uh, but it has to be done in a thoughtful way. And in particular, that zero to five foot area around the home needs to be fairly non-combustible uh, to address that flame contact uh, uh, ignition source. And as you'll see, as we go through these slides, we're giving some credit to some of the folks that came and uh, spoke at the, the workshop series that we held, uh, both of these individuals are with the UC extension. As it relates to this issue, we wanted to really hone in on some, some it's a little nuanced, but it's, uh, it's really helpful to know where we are today. So kind of where we are today and where we've been in recent years is 
we're trying to illustrate in this very simplistic graphic where this dashed line is just a generic city or town boundary. And after the, the tunnel fire in the Oakland and Berkeley Hills 30 years ago, uh, there was a law that said we should be mapping the very high fire hazard severity zones within local jurisdictions so that folks are aware of the, the fire hazard risk in their community. It wasn't until 2008 that the state actually required uh, buildings within that zone to meet a WUI building standard. So there's certain standards that really re, uh, relate to the non-combustibility of the building materials that you're using, as well as both the design of the structure. So making sure vents and eaves are designed in a way that uh, embers are less likely uh, to ignite the home. That's kind of the status quo that has existed for you know, the past you know, 30 and, and 15 years respectively. Over the past few years, there have been a few changes to how uh, development and housing is designed in the WUI. Uh, the first is that in 2008, in addition to the building code being an element to how housing and other development occurs in the WUI, there's also fire safe regulations that have been in effect outside of local jurisdictions, so in unincorporated areas. Those now apply to the very high fire hazard severity zone within local government. So that's getting into uh, efforts related to access and egress of, of new development, um, as well as a range of other uh, measures that are going to make uh, development that occurs in that zone uh, more fire adapted. And then last year, the legislature went a step further in terms of expanding how uh, new construction is going to take place uh, in local jurisdictions. And it starts first by requiring CAL FIRE to not just map the very high fire hazard severity zone, but also map and publish the high and moderate within local governments. Uh, and then for the high zone, they're then expanding that to now be a part of that same building standard that the very high zone is for. And they're going through their own state process to make a determination on what they should be doing in that moderate zone. Should it be the full WUI code or maybe some abbreviated version that's a little less uh, strict. So in addition to those changes, CAL FIRE is also going through a mapping update where they're uh, you know, bringing in the latest science, all the knowledge that they've collected over recent years in terms of fire behavior. And it's very likely that as part of that, we could see some of these zones expand, just given the nature of the new information that they're bringing into that mapping process. It might not always be that case, depending on where you are in the region or the state. All of this is to just say that where we are today is not where we were yesterday. And a lot of these changes and regulations haven't really uh, yet you know, changed how we're growing uh, in these areas with wildfire risk. So as we're thinking about what more we need to do, I think it's just important to understand some of these recent changes that have already set in place how we will do things differently going forward. In addition to acknowledging that there's a lot that locals can do, we're all about trying to get wildfire policy into the housing element, as well as sea level rise and flooding and earthquake and the whole gamut. Uh, there's some good examples out there of how communities can do more to develop or update a home hardening defensible space program. Fire Safe Marin is a great model for those that haven't already done it in terms of getting communities together to do the defensible space and home hardening work in their communities. Importantly, the state's also showing up to the table with more money to the, for these issues with new pilot programs for uh, home hardening that will be expanded in 2023. Uh, as well as financial assistance to low and moderate income families for primarily defensible space work. So lots of exciting kind of new resources that are coming for this issue. Uh, and a lot that communities could be doing in their housing element to point to actions they're going to take. Uh, we're going to do one more challenge before we stop for Q&A, but as uh, Kate is presenting on challenge two, Go ahead and ask any questions that you have on anything that we've touched uh, thus far, as well as on what Kate's about to present. Great, thanks, Michael. So now we'll go into challenge two, which is about how wildfire adaptation is complicated by housing density and property setbacks in the WUI. So back when Michael was talking about the different way homes ignite, he skipped the middle one, which is radiant heat. 
So radiant heat is one of the three main ways a structure can ignite. So basically what's happening in radiant heat ignition is that a structure nearby this main structure that we're focusing on is ignited by maybe ember or flame contact, but then is burning a fire so hot that it can actually radiantly ignite the structure that is close to it. So this is of concern, particularly when we're looking at not only houses with sheds or accessory dwelling units, but also houses that are not able to uh, adapt in terms of creating that ideal amount of defensible space because their neighbors are so close to them. So if we go back and or go into the next slide, I'll kind of show you how that works. Um, as you can see here, these are the three zones that wildfire professionals like Daniel Gorham um, brought up in our sessions to address, and they're often called zones one, two, and three as they increase in distance from the main structure. As you can see with this house, the zone two is already reaching the neighbor's house. So maybe zone one is, is even in the neighbor's um, property. So this is, poses a real problem, and um, it, it's, it's important to recognize that there are already houses in the WUI that look like this. So uh, moving forward, we really need to address kind of what, what happens to those. So if we go to the next dot slide, um, Daniel and his colleagues at IBHS, NIST, and CAL FIRE are already carrying out some experiments with which aim to address this issue. So these experiments are addressing how or investigating how structures ignite under different separation distance scenarios using different types of materials. And the study is looking at for separations for single ham family homes from each other, but also smaller structures, as I mentioned before, like accessory dwelling units and sheds. And these experiments might provide some really valuable insights for jurisdictions looking to address this narrow setbacks issue. So home hardening can be a really great way to address this uh, limited structure separation issue. And the study should have some really key insights for which materials work best and what distances are preferable. We suggest that jurisdictions track this research closely and consider future action informed by the research when it's released. And then on to the next slide. Some towns are already enacting policy to harden structures and increase their town's resilience in the face of increasing wildfires and limited setbacks. Um, the town of Portola Valley recently passed an amendment to their building code that goes an extra mile in defining what materials are ignition resistant. As some of our experts expressed to us throughout our work on this workshop series, not all ignition resistant materials are created equal. And sometimes building codes can be a bit broad in defining what materials constitute as ignition resistant and don't go as far as to say completely unable to ignite. Um, and in terms of equity considerations, for the building code expansion policy in Portola Valley, the city council was kind of a model in recognizing the need to balance wildfire, housing, and equity together, and was weighing an increase in home hardening costs against fire insurance rates or the possibility of homes being destroyed in a wildfire. So they were very thoughtful in balancing these issues and, and kind of something that jurisdictions will have to navigate as they move through this topic and as new kind of information comes out about what needs to be done to homes to cope with, uh, with these issues. And then finally, this code wasn't necessarily specific to areas with narrow setbacks as the town of Portola Valley has kind of larger property sizes, but it does include measures that would address radiant heat concerns for limited setbacks, uh, including accessory dwelling units or sheds. So now that we've wrapped up, oh, I guess just another policy option here, sorry. Um, similar to kind of energy efficiency and electrification reach codes, codes passed across the state, we are dubbing this recommendation a wildfire reach code. 
and suggesting that jurisdictions investigate if adopting a higher building standard might be a good choice for their jurisdiction if they have a lot of suburban wooey neighborhoods with limited setbacks. So now we will move into the first session of questions. I think we are going to have maybe about five, five minutes, five to 10 minutes for questions right now. We're going to open the floor again at the end of our presentation after the next two challenges. But um, if you have any questions now, you can feel free to throw them in the chat or as they come in throughout the rest of the presentation. Great. Thanks, Kate and Michael. Um, yeah, we thought this would be a good opportunity to break up uh, break up the presentation and have you know as close to a dialogue as possible given the uh, Zoom webinar limitations. So the first question that came up is, uh, how could a FireWise community or a FireSafe group work with city planners and public agencies to ensure that efforts are coordinated and reflected in planning documents? I think that's a good question. I think it really depends on the bandwidth that your community group has, as well as uh, kind of how large the city is. And I, I just mentioned that because the housing element is just one place. It's an active place in all 101 jurisdictions right now. Uh, but there's also other opportunities to influence policy. So if the group has the collective bandwidth to really engage with the city, the housing element is a great place to do that. Uh, the safety element is another document that is being updated regularly and is another place that that, that group could really engage with. And then the final kind of uh, uh, common document that's kind of updated with frequency is the local hazard mitigation plan. And all of those documents are informing the general plan. It's definitely a lot for kind of a community group to keep track of. So I think it really depends on just how much bandwidth you have to engage. I think the good news is, is if you are interested in issues that you think directly link to housing and are interested in uh, seeing more action on a home hardening program or defensible space and want to lift that up as a priority, I think you know now for pretty much any jurisdiction is a good time to raise that. Uh, and we're hearing from local government staff that it's an issue that's been coming up in conversation. So, uh, would recommend just you know checking out recent council agenda items. There might be a housing working group that's been formed within the jurisdiction. Uh, now is a good time, and it really is just a few months of window where this is a very live conversation within cities before they have to submit drafts to the state uh, for review. So uh, if you have energy now, there is an opportunity to kind of uh, have conversations with the city. Yeah, I would agree. I think it also depends on the capacity of the, the city itself. And so the more communities can come together and, you know, attend the city council meetings, the planning commission hearings, and really weigh in on these critically important uh, general plan documents, the more likely that uh, the policies will, you know, really connect to the, the firewise community or, or fire safe groups. Um, all right, and the next question is also from Anonymous. Uh, existing research has shown that land use density matters in terms of wildfire risk, with higher density locations typically having lower risk as compared to sprawl communities. How is this reflected in state and local housing policy? I don't think it is really well reflected in, in either place. There, there is research that has looked at housing density. Um, and that trend does play out uh, that, that you're mentioning, but I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nuance to it as well in terms of generally speaking, uh, we don't see too much high density right up against kind of a more wildland interface, uh, and so a, a piece of that is also just uh, the nature of, of what what the wooey typically looks like. I don't think I have a great answer to the question. I think it also has to do not just with density, but also with kind of what type of building materials are being used and what the defensible space uh, looks like. Um, so I, th I think it's a little trickier and, and I think you see that in some of the research where it's not, you know, if you densify, uh, you know, rural to urban community, that that in and of itself is going to reduce the risk. I think it's a little bit more complex than that, but uh, I can't think of how that is playing out directly in kind of state or local housing policy at this time. 
Yeah, and I think it goes, you know, I think we'll see it happening more after that these next housing elements are, are done because this is really, you know, eight years ago when the last housing element cycle happened, we, you know, weren't really dealing with the same issues to the same degree uh, that we are now. And so I think once we have uh, these housing elements, you know, written, there will be, you know, a lot more documentation for the next cycle, which is unfortunately in eight years. Um, all right, maybe we'll do one more question before we move on. Um, and this is a little bit more specific. So uh, how, how does one take into account the likelihood of Diablo wins, which greatly increase both the speed and fire spread and fer ferocity of the fire? So I suspect that's partially linked to kind of CAL FIRE's mapping, I'm, I'm guessing. So uh, I can't, I'm not following that process super closely, but I do know that wind is an element of it and they are thinking about uh, how climate change is potentially changing the nature of, of what could be kind of a likely wind of, you know, one in 50 or one in 100 year event. Um, so they are integrating that as one of their factors along with a number of others, uh, but would have to kind of catch up and, and talk to Cal Fire about exactly how those kind of extreme wind events are being factored in. I would mention that that IBHS research that Kate mentioned, uh, where they have these laboratories, they are also studying kind of the effect of different wind speeds on the code that they're suggesting. So. Um, looking at how different materials and different uh, structure types are interacting with uh, kind of embers being cast at, at different wind speeds. Got it. All right. We have quite a few more questions, and I have a few questions for you guys as well, but I think we should move on. And if we have more time at the end, we'll get to the others. Awesome. So uh, the third challenge is all about evacuations, which is something that has come up quite a bit as communities have been talking about uh, housing element updates. And it's largely in the context of uh, you know, genuine concern that uh, there's already potentially uh, fear that there's not gonna be an ability to evacuate in time in a wildfire event. And that uh, by adding housing either directly into a neighborhood or downstream of a neighborhood that maybe is still using the same corridor to evacuate, that this is going to create increased bottlenecks uh, within communities. And we don't have a silver bullet for, for any of these issues, but we are hoping that some of the information that we've collected is helpful in terms of figuring out next steps that communities can take. And the first one that we think is really valuable is to really diagnose and understand what are people's concerns with evacuation. And typically, a lot of those concerns fit into one or one of two buckets. And there's very different strategies that could, could get at each of these challenges. The first on the left with kind of the A bracket is really focused on right of way and access and egress. And it's all about there being enough space for kind of a, an individual, a, a resident uh, escaping, uh, harm's way and a uh, emergency vehicle going the opposite way, making sure that there's road width uh, to support that. Um, so that that's the first. And the second is all about just the overall capacity to evacuate an area that's at risk of wildfire. Um, it's a much more dynamic analysis to actually kind of figure out if, if there's bottlenecks within a community, but it's making sure that there's enough capacity to actually clear an area that's at risk of wildfire or some other event. And evacuation is not just the transportation network and its road width and its ability to move people through it. It's also how quickly uh, notifications go out, how those notifications roll out, the interpretation of those notifications by the public. Uh, there's also ideas of areas of refuge where could people go to a certain place that's uh, safe within the area that might need to evacuate. And there's a whole host of individuals that are now entering this space. It really used to be uh, emergency management, but we'll get into some changing context where state laws are bringing planners and uh, additional kind of uh, public departments into the conversation of evacuation. Um, there's also a much uh, greater set of tools that are out there to help uh, do really robust evacuation planning. 
I'll focus on the graphic here on the right. Uh, Kate helped put this together for our session on evacuation where there's more and more platforms that are enabling people to look at, at the transportation network and uh, its capacities uh, to, uh, to move travel demand uh, through. Uh, that also links in communication and how people are receiving that message and the decisions they're making, as well as how uh, a wildfire evolves in its footprint, uh, potentially in a Diablo wind event, uh, and how quickly do you need to clear different uh, sections of a community as that uh, wildfire evolves. And so there are tools that are being developed that really link all of these pieces together that uh, can provide communities with a lot more information to make informed decisions. Uh, a range of state laws, uh, a few of them passed after the Paradise Fire in 2018, and then a few last year, have really changed evacuation planning from just a, uh, you know, uh, police fire emergency management exercise in terms of coming up with plans. It now needs to be integrated into the general plan through AB 747, and there's new requirements for some of the modeling that's needed to support uh, how evacuation routes are determined. Uh, so increasingly, this is a changing field where more individuals are gonna be involved and its application is now linked to uh, the general plan. Uh, UC Berkeley, uh, is a great place where new research and new tools are being developed for evacuation and they're working with some Bay Area communities. Uh, there's also some existing platforms out there to get notifications out in real time. So these are platforms that are being used in real wildfires to issue uh, evacuation warnings. Uh, and some of those tools are being kind of thought of as possible kind of early tools to, to help diagnose the evacuation challenges. Um, but within all of these different tools that are out there, there's an acknowledgement that there's uh, a lot of hyper-local issues that can make one strategy or one approach to solving an issue more or less effective. And so there really is a need for local planning. A strategy that might work well in one community might not actually solve an evacuation challenge in another. So all we're calling for as people are thinking about the housing element is just pointing to the fact that there's new requirements coming for an evacuation assessment. And there's an opportunity to not just think about that evacuation assessment in terms of kind of what the community looks like today, but potentially borrowing from the housing element and thinking through what evacuation can look like with new housing development um, and actually diagnosing where are there these different uh, challenges of either right of way, as well as uh, capacity to move people out of harm's way. There are examples for communities that are kind of already pushing hard on the evacuation issue, which is great. Uh, one example is in San Rafael where they've got a parking box program where they're making it clear where there is the space to then enable the appropriate right of way within a community. And then the second is out of the city of Berkeley which is a pretty innovative strategy in uh, terms of sending out uh, certain notices to Berkeley residents that there's an opportunity to pre-evacuate during not just a red flag day where conditions are really difficult, um, or not really difficult, where conditions are really uh, prone to wildfire, but when those exist as well as really, really high winds are expected where that wildfire could move really quickly. And what they've done is they've partnered with hotels within the community to offer discounted rates to residents. They've asked residents to do their own pre-planning if there is an ability for them to uh, spend the night with uh, friends who are not in uh, the WUI to, to consider doing that, all in an effort to just reduce the number of households that need to evacuate if a fire occurs. So it's a fairly new idea. I think there's a lot of challenges with doing it in practice, but it is, one kind of practical approach that could be taken to uh, think about dealing with evacuation in some of these areas. Great. So now we'll launch into the last issue, which is challenge four, and that's really adapting to wildfire at the community scale rather than the individual property level. So if we go to the next slide, we know that as climate change exacerbates the wildfire 
uh, crisis and, and as the Bay Area reckons with its own housing crisis, there has really never been more of an important time to prioritize wildfire adaptation within the context of housing. But efforts to adapt unless they're coordinated may not be fruitful and energy, momentum and resources could all go to waste if there is this disorder and confusion or individual in impact and isolation on the left. So what we're really going for is these arrows all pointing in the same direction on the right. Um, and that includes on the individual level, the, the jurisdictional level, and even the regional level. So if we go to the next slide, you can kind of see what that looks like. And this is the ideal fire adapted community where there are some measures in the WUI that are being handled by emergency professionals like fuel breaks and watershed management. But also if we if you click some of these policy and program ideas will come to play that we've been talking about today that could kind of help to get the whole community adapted and, and preserve that uh, wildfire adaptation on the neighborhood scale, the jurisdictional scale, and even cross jurisdictions. So if we go to the next slide, this isn't necessarily an easy feat. And it, there is strong need for individual homeowners to act and invest in adapt adapting their homes to wildfire, which we've mentioned before can be costly. So this creates a need for jurisdictions to help these homeowners adapt and not have to front so much money to keep their property safe, but also to keep their neighbor's property safe. So we know that wildfire adaptation doesn't just occur on a neighborhood, on a home scale, it occurs on a neighborhood scale. And that's narrated by this picture on the right, which shows that, you know, we know it's likely that if one house ignites, then the whole neighborhood could also ignite. And tensions can arise when one neighborhood has adapted or one neighbor has adapted to wildfire, but their neighbor has not, and they might have some tree that's that's worrying um, the rest of the neighbors. And so this also creates a, a need for education, incentivization, and resources to create that collective impact and collective understanding. And there are some examples of uh, re, uh, organizations doing this throughout the Bay Area. So the First and most, um, most interesting is the MWPA. They're a JPA located in Marin and they're focused around creating uh, resources, education, and also funds to distribute to the jurisdictions in, within their uh, JPA to help increase you know, awareness and adaptation to wildfire. They have some really interesting programs and have been doing some great work. So we're suggesting to groups of jurisdictions within the Bay Area to maybe consider this as a multi-agency collaborative effort to advance wildfire adaptations. And then on the jurisdictional level, there's a lot that jurisdictions can do. Jurisdictions are a key way that information gets to residents and it's really never been easier for them to just point to some great resources that are being developed at the state level like this CAL FIRE education, communication, and resource website, which is readyforwildfire.org. And then finally, on the neighborhood scale, as folks have already mentioned in the Q&A, uh, neighbors can band together and form FireWise communities through FireWise USA, which enables them to rally around education, communication pipelines in their neighborhood, and advocacy to their jurisdiction and other levels of government to advance and promote wildfire-centered networks and adapt their communities. So finally, we will conclude and I'll pass it to Michael for some closing thoughts. Yeah, so we just wanted to quickly provide a summary of kind of what we went through. We have these four challenges and uh, kind of highlighted a few of the policy approaches that, that we're recommending uh, for communities to consider. The information that we presented is in a resource guide that we produced. Uh, I think a link has already gone up earlier in the chat to where you can find it. It has more context for each of these as well as additional kind of policy and program uh, approaches that could be taken. That's the seventh resource guide. It was the final one in the series. It's probably the best place to start uh, if you are interested in this work, but we do have more information on 
the MWPA and what that uh, Joint Powers Authority looks like, uh, as well as kind of a briefer on the new evacuation laws and some of those state resources that are coming out this year. As, oh. <laughs> as Michael mentioned, um, all of the information, these workshops, you can see the, the recordings and all the resources that we produced in tandem with the workshops um, in the chat in that link, um, or you can just look up ABAG technical assistance portal and you should be able to find it, um, wildfires and how to preserve and protect housing. And then just some final closing thoughts before we open up the floor again. Um, wildfire is definitely going through an inflection point after California has seen some devastating wildfires like the campfire in 2018. And these wildfires have really sparked the interest, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> for some policy action and program action that we're just seeing the fruits of now. And it's really great that, the, you know, now is the time that the issue is receiving some increased political interest, attention and funding, but there won't be a silver bullet or a quick process for adapting to wildfire and it will take sustained investment, attention and time. And, and that kind of goes back to our challenge for about having everyone act in the same direction with coordinated impact. So we really appreciate you being here with us today. And now we will turn back to the Q&A for a few questions before we wrap up. All right, thank you both so much for such an informative uh, presentation. I think those four challenges really are like the, the critical issues that we're dealing with and being able to you know, address some of these some of these challenges um, and come up with, you know, specific policies and solutions, uh, you know, give, gives gives me some hope. And I think the the idea, the issue of collective action challenge four, you know, is something that we've been thinking a lot about for, you know, every climate challenge. There's constantly this issue of collective action, and wildfire is no different. Um, and we've really been thinking a lot about the need for, you know, a multi-jurisdictional strategy because not only it, can this issue not be addressed at the home scale. But it needs to be addressed at you know the regional or sub-regional scale because wildfire is not going to stop at a jurisdictional border. Um, but on that note, on, on the continued note of wildfire, we have a few questions in a couple more minutes. So, um, would you be able to expand a bit on the, the concept of wildfire reach codes? Are there examples of cities that that have implemented this? So the best example and. I say best example, I don't know if it may be the only example that we're aware of is Portola Valley, um, where they have amended its chapter 7a of the building code is where kind of these wooey conditions are applied. Uh, every three years, the state updates it and uh, Portola Valley really is a community. It's, you know, it's up in the hills. The entire community is, you know, not necessarily in the very high fire hazard severity zone, but you know, very easily self-described the entire community is at risk of wildfire. And uh, their community has really kind of pushed on a lot of different aspects of wildfire adaptation. And uh, just this past December, they adopted kind of a, an amendment to the chapter 7A code that is more restrictive than the state standard. And it's basically limiting the types of materials that can be used to ones that are even less combustible than the list that's on the state code. And um, I believe that, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in this part of the new state code cycle, uh, that some of that research that's on structure separation and how do different materials perform, uh, it's possible that that could influence the state code and there maybe isn't a need for jurisdictions to individually go through these up updates. But I guess simply to answer the question, Portola Valley, uh, they've got, uh, as of December 2021, some uh, more stringent standards for how uh, buildings are designed. Got it. Interesting. Okay, I think we might only have time for one more question, but we're going to go out on a very exciting note. Um, so, you know, density is one of the best ways to address our housing crisis and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And ADUs are a really great way to do that. But as ADUs become increasingly popular, what are some steps that cities can take to make sure they're not, that they are not putting existing and future communities at risk from wildfire? Yeah, 
Yeah, this is a great question and something that we grappled with a lot, especially in our uh, kind of capstone resource that we produced. And we, in that resource, we detail some of the jurisdictions that are actively grappling with the issue. So for example, the city of Berkeley and the city of Oakland are both looking at how can they expand their own overlay zones that they've developed locally with local knowledge to kind of limit some of the ADU development standards um, in those areas. So that might include having a certain setback or having certain materials that the ADU has to be constructed with. Um, and the ADUs also uh, impact the evacuation concerns that we were talking about earlier. So um, in the hills, there might be you know, more people associated with these ADUs. So maybe you wanna limit the number of bedrooms to one bedroom or limit parking um, for ADUs. And, and it is a really difficult answer. There are a lot of equity concerns um, there's not really one answer, and I think it's it's got to be looked at locally. So if you look at that resource guide, which is available in the link that we sent earlier in the chat, then you'll find resource guide seven, which will have some background as to how jurisdictions are grappling with this and, and some context there. Yeah, and I would just say that it, it really is about balance. I think ADUs were the issue that kind of were on the front end of housing element updates where jurisdictions were kind of weighing these challenges of we've got a plan for more housing, we've got wildfire concerns. ADUs with the streamlining bills that were passed is kind of maybe a year or two ahead of the housing element updates. Uh, in addition to kind of, uh, I think a lot of the communities that we highlight have limited how ADUs apply in areas with wildfire, but they do it in different ways. They use different overlays, how they determine those are slightly different. Some communities are using quotas, so it's really about allowing ADUs for like the first 20% of properties that want to do it in a certain zone. So uh, we don't necessarily have a right or wrong way to do it at this point, but there are some interesting ways where communities have really thought thought through what it means to add density in areas with wildfire risk, in areas where maybe you are adding uh, kind of some limited structure separation. So um, as Kate mentioned, and there's a new link in the chat directly to that resource guide. Great, thank you. And yes, I'd like to encourage everybody to click that link and check out all of their incredible resources because they have really produced a lot of uh, really informative guidance that can assist both uh, you know, cities and uh, local community advocates in really coming up with the right, the right policies and, and guidance for addressing these critical issues. So thank you so much again to Kate and Michael for taking the time to join us today. And thanks to all of you for attending this webinar. Uh, we hope to be able to continue this conversation very soon. And this is just the first taste of our Resilience Playbook webinar uh, series, wildfire webinar series which is going to continue in May. So please stay, stay tuned. You can also watch our previous conversations about the environmental case for housing and more information on housing elements on our, our YouTube channel and our website. And finally, the work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and working lands while also creating thriving communities is made possible by you. So if you have the ability to donate or uh, participate in any of our events or take action on our website, please, feel free to do so. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your evening and take care. Goodbye, everyone.